Hello, everyone. Welcome to our presentation with John Bravender from the National Weather Service. I'm Gavin Imamura and what Aina Haina prepared. Uh, we are helping with this presentation today. We are a local community group located here in Aina Haina and working here with the residents of East Oahu. And part of our mission is to do awareness and help with these presentations. So today we will have a session with John and he is a, uh, let me see if I got this correct here, a warning coordinating, a warning coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service. He's been there since, oh, he's been here in Hawaii since 2006. And an interesting tidbit about John is that he flew on one of the recon planes for, which hurricane was that, John? Sorry, I can't read my own late. notes here. It was Hurricane Lane. Hurricane Lane back in 2018. Yeah. So anyway, I'm going to let John take over from here and take it away. Thanks, Gavin. Appreciate it. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Um, we'll be going over uh, just uh, some random uh, hurricane tidbits here, looking at last year, looking at next year, and talking about some preparedness information. As we go through this presentation, uh, there will be a, a box text box that you can type questions into. Um, feel free to ask any questions as we go through this and we'll take a look at those at the end and uh, try to try to try to answer them as well. Uh, I guess uh, first off um, I, we, we, we did a, a similar talk story like this earlier in the month and uh, had a few different questions that uh, was, we'll try to address in the presentation this time as well. Um, first off, talking about hurricanes in general or tropical cyclones. This graphic here shows a pretty uh, general idea of what a hurricane looks like. Uh, eye in the center, an intense eye wall of thunderstorms surrounding it, a rain bands circling that as well, and the wind flowing through it. Um, a few ingredients that we need to have a, a tropical cyclone form, you need uh, warm water. Uh, the cyclones get their energy from the ocean. So you're looking for water temperatures at least 80 degrees Fahrenheit, um, you know, generally more looking at 83 or warmer uh, for good strengthening. Uh, you need an uh, area of thunderstorms. You need uh, a disturbance, like a, a, a circulation center, a, a low to form that the thunderstorms can focus around. You need something that high levels in the atmosphere to help to stabilize the atmosphere. And you also need very low wind shear. Wind shear is a changing wind with height. And in this graphic here, if you can imagine this, a hurricane like this is extending up to, to 50 or 60,000 feet up in the air. So you're talking miles up in the air. And uh, if, the, if the wind changes too much with direction, like blowing from one direction down low and another direction up high, it creates a tilting. And the, the, the spiral you see along, along the eye wall there, that gets disrupted and tilted over. So it doesn't maintain that, uh, the, the structure there and it ends up weakening. Or if it's, in, if it's trying to form, it doesn't develop or strengthen as, as much as the otherwise would. Here in Hawaii, we, we tend to have a lot of wind shear over us. Uh, trade winds at the surface out of the Northeast and high up in the atmosphere, winds out of the Southwest. So blowing from two different directions. Uh, obviously that's not the case all the time, the, that pattern can change, but it's those uh, changing wind with height that we have most of the time that leads to a lot of weakening as uh, hurricanes approach. We saw that in 2018 with the lane coming up from the south, uh, making a lot of northward progress into really strong wind shear until it finally uh, fell apart and shifted off to the west. But even with that one, uh, even though it didn't make a, a direct landfall, we still had some significant impacts, set a record, a statewide record for amount of rain, second in the U.S. only behind Hurricane Harvey for the amount of rainfall from a tropical cyclone. So even removed from the center, we, we still had some pretty, pretty major impacts from it. So I'm using the term tropical cyclone as a, a generic uh, classification. That, that captures all different strengths. You have tropical depressions with winds uh, less than 39 miles an hour, tropical storm with winds uh, 39 to 73 miles an hour, 
and then a hurricane with wind 74 miles an hour or greater. And here on the image, uh, we, we have examples of all, all those. This goes back to 2014. Uh, if you remember for 2014, Hurricane or Tropical Isel made landfall. It's a hurricane here. It made landfall. It just weakened to a tropical storm before hitting the Big Island, uh, causing a, a, a lot of tree damage there, some flooding problems, and uh, damage to the windward side of the Big Island. In this image here, Isel is a major hurricane. Uh, to the east of that, you have Tropical Storm Julio. That was just forming. Uh, eventually, it would become a hurricane as well and would, would thankfully turn turn northeast of the state and not bring us uh, any direct impacts. And also on here, west of us, is Tropical Depression Genevieve. Uh, Genevieve would eventually strengthen again, become a major hurricane uh, east of the dateline, and then cross over to the dateline to become a super typhoon. Uh, so it went through some rapid intensification after, after this point. Uh, one thing I'll note here, depressions normally don't have a name. When, the, when a, a, a typical life cycle for a tropical cyclone, it starts as a depression. Once it develops into a tropical storm, it will be given a name. And it gets the name from the basin where it forms. If it's east of 140 west, it'll get a name from the Eastern Pacific list. If it's between 140 west longitude and an international dateline, it'll get a name from the Central Pacific list. Uh, and then we'll keep that name as it moves basins or as it weakens. So in this case, Genevieve developed in the Eastern Pacific, uh, became a storm, weakened as it moved westward, was just a, a tropical depression at this point, but then redeveloped again, re-intensified, and eventually became a hurricane later. The other category referencing on that list is a, a major hurricane. Um, major hurricanes, uh, are defined here on the Sapphire Simpson scale. Um, example graphics here, Tropical Storm, Isel was one of those as it made landfall. Uh, Eva 1982 was a category one hurricane. Uh, just remember that it was a very late season hurricane, knocked out, uh, caused a lot of damage on Kauai, knocked out power, uh, especially even through Thanksgiving, people were, were, were dealing with no power going through that late in the, in the month. Uh, Flossie in 2007 was a Category 2 hurricane that passed south of us. Uh, Flossie is one of those that uh, keeps coming up every six years. Uh, we'll, we'll talk again about that last year from the, the 2016, or last year, the 2019 example of, from Flossie. And then as I mentioned, the, the major hurricanes, Category 3, 4, and 5, uh, are uh, highlighted for their extreme damage potential. Uh, earlier, I also mentioned with Genevieve, the uh, difference between hurricane and typhoon. Uh, the cutoff of that is just the, the dateline. Uh, east of the dateline, uh, refer to uh, a tropical system with wind 74 miles an hour or greater as a hurricane. West of the dateline, it's a typhoon. I also mentioned super typhoon, which is, is a, a typhoon with winds of 150 miles an hour. So actually double typhoon strength is a, a super typhoon, which um, we, we've had several in, in, in a number in recent times over the past few years that can be extremely, extremely damaging and, and dangerous. So looking at where tropical cyclones form, you can see a, the, the graphic here shows uh, the, the color, the, the little lines are tr the, the tracks from the different tropical cyclones. Green is a tropical depression, Yellow is tropical storm, red is hurricane, and purple, there's a few purples in there, those are major hurricanes, which is category three or higher. Hawaii circled on here, you can see us in relation to uh, the West Coast. A lot of activity going in the Eastern Pacific. Uh, much, the Eastern Pacific is a lot busier, has a lot more activity than we have in, in the Central Pacific. And grab a spotlight. Try to highlight this here for a moment. So here we are. Um, so a lot of activity passing south of the state. Uh, this was a, a, another question that came up uh, in, in the last one. Uh, traditionally in the past, 
Um, you either have tropical cyclones forming the east and moving west, moving east to west and passing south of us, or as you can see, we have ones that occasionally will curve northward. Um, here's one, Here, here's a, a, a Niki from 1992, curving northward as a major hurricane and striking Kauai. Uh, the bulk of the activity passes south of us, uh, but as you'll see from this past year, that uh, it's coming a little farther north, it seems. And that's one thing uh, researchers, researchers have found over the past several decades is as ocean temperatures warm, that the hurricane tracks shift uh, poleward. So in the Northern Hemisphere, they shift more towards the North Pole. In the Southern Hemisphere, they, they've seen the impact there as well, shifting more towards the South Pole. So that puts Hawaii in more of an area of potential threat or impact because of those warmer waters going extend farther north. So we're in hurricane season right now. Hurricane season runs from June to November. Uh, the bulk of our activity here in the Central Pacific occurs in August. Uh, you can see that, like the last half of July to the first half of September captures the, the, the bulk of our season. Uh, late in the year, into October, uh, this, this graph kind of tapers off a little longer, has a longer tail out in the end there. Um, those are a lot of from El Nino years. El Nino, ocean waters are warmer. We tend to have busier years. They also tend to be longer lasting. You can have hurricanes later in the season as uh, they maintain their strength because of the warmer water. We're not in El Nino right now, and we'll talk about that uh, in the last half of this presentation when you talk about the outlook. So where do we stand last year? So 2019, uh, here I mentioned, uh, this is the graphic I used as, as we were going through last hurricane season, calling it five-ish tropical cyclones. I always like to include Barbara on this list because um, it, it, it was a threat. We ended up, it was the first uh, uh, coordinated hurricane briefings that we did for the year, even before it crossed 140 West into the Central Pacific. When NHC was forecasting it, we were starting to do briefings here, but Barbara ended up weakening before it crossed 140. So when it comes to the, to the year and stats, it doesn't count. We are a scientific organization after all. So our basin is 140 in the West in the Dateline. So Barbara actually never made it across 140. So we ended the year in November with five tropical cyclones. However, uh, I am a meteorologist, so I can never give you a straight answer. Uh, that's not where we ended up for the total. Um, Kiko, uh, this little, show you this little level of this little dot right here, just crossing 140 is the, the one point that we had for uh, Kiko which was weakening as it moved in. A CPHC ended up uh, issuing one bulletin on it before dissipating it, before it became a remnant low. But every year during the off season, we go back and we reanalyze all the, all the tracks and all the point, all the forecast points every six hours, looking at any satellite data that we didn't have in real time, any ship observations, and any details that would help us come up with the best possible position, intensity, size, everything associated with it. So you go through the, these every six hours and they become part of what they call the best track. This is the climatological record that researchers will use moving forward to know what happened during our hurricane season. So during the reanalysis, we realized that Kiko had dissipated before it crossed 140. So an update uh, during the, the winter time, we ended up striking that from our list. So here are what we ended up with for the 2019 season for tropical cyclones. And this is where it fits with the, within recent history. For last year, uh, six the year before, you see a few uh, peaks on here. 2015 stands out, 16, that was our record setting year. Uh, 2016 was also a very strong El Nino year. Uh, I mentioned there's a correlation between tropical cyclone activity and uh, El Nino, La Nina. During El Nino years, the Pacific is busy and the Atlantic is quiet. 
and during La Nina years, the Pacific is quiet and the Atlantic is busy. I'll leave that there, more foreshadowing about talking about the tropical outlook. Well, going back to last year, we'll, we'll talk about a few of the cyclones that we had. Uh, even though we didn't have any direct impacts, there were a few distant impacts. Barbara was one of those. Uh, in the Eastern Pacific, it, it was a major hurricane for a, a time. Uh, you can see from the, the purple on the track is when it was a major hurricane, it actually went through some rapid intensification from storm to hurricane to major hurricane. As it was moving westward, it created some really large seas, uh, big wave conditions that eventually brought high surf to the east-facing shores of the islands in, in July after it had dissipated. The weekend before it crossed 140, but even after it moved westward into our basin, it came near Hawaii, had a lot of moisture left over, a lot of deep tropical moisture that uh, hit the islands, uh, interacted with the terrain, and brought some heavy rain and uh, uh, flooding to Maui and Hawaii counties in the eastern half of the state. Eric was our, our, our hurricane for last year. In, in 2018, Every cyclone that we had in the basin was a hurricane at some point. Last year, we only had one, and that was Eric. And Eric also was a major hurricane at, at one point. It passed uh, south, of the, south of the state, but also as it was a hurricane, a major hurricane, ended up building a lot of waves and brought a lot of surf to the islands from both east and south, south facing shores. And then as it passed by, uh, some of that moisture on the northern edge of it uh, brought some heavy rain. Uh, first to the Big Island on the 2nd, and then to the western half of the state, to Kauai County, a few days later. Flossie, we mentioned Flossie from 2007. It passed by south of us as a, as a hurricane before weakening. Six years later, it came back in 2013. It actually took a very similar track to what uh, it took here. Weekend approached from the east and weekend before reaching us. Uh, 2019, uh, Flossie is back again on our radar. In this case, uh, the, the little strip of red there, you can see it was a hurricane in the Eastern Pacific, weakened to a tropical storm, and then just steadily weakened as it approached, a weakened to a depression before it reached us, and then eventually turned north. But as it was a storm, it still created some large surf freeze facing shores, and then brought some moisture with it that led to some heavy rain for us. A number of people ask why Flossie keeps showing up again. Uh, the the list the list for tropical cyclone names there are six of them uh, for the eastern Pacific they're used alphabetically um, and it's re recycled every six years so in, in this case uh, you, you see the pattern 2007 2013 2019 uh, normally if there's a, a big event if there's a, a catastrophic damage if there's loss of life will retire a name from the list. Uh, that's why you won't see another Hurricane Aniki. Uh, that was so impactful for us, we retired it from the list, so it won't come up again. Flossie is one of those that uh, more seems to, to taunt us, uh, approaching us, uh, comes back every six years, threatens, but doesn't do anything significant. Uh, so that's why it keeps coming back year after year. So I can not necessarily looking forward to 2025 when it comes up on the list again to see what happens with that one. So Kiko, um, we already talked about uh, in the reanalysis, Kiko, we, we, we pulled it, it wasn't part of the Central Pacific, but it was an unusual one because it was out in the East for a, a very long time. Um, it developed near 110 degrees West and was out there for almost two weeks. Uh, that's a, a pretty long time for a system, especially not one not to move into the Central Pacific. You can see from the track here, it, it developed rapidly, uh, we became a hurricane, intensified to major hurricane, and then weakened a storm, weakened to a tropical storm, and then started to, to zigzag the, at the mercy of the large scale steering winds. And we had a very, what we call a progressive pattern where weather systems will come through so you'll have winds out of the south ahead of a low and then northwest out of the north behind it, causing it to move northward and then move southwest again, then move northwest. Created this oscillating pattern that uh, ended up 
only moving about six and a half miles an hour over the course of those 12 days. And by the time it hit 140 West, it had weakened. So had Kiko taken more of a direct path, that would have been our fifth tropical cyclone for the year. So as it stands, we had four. Um, here was our outlook going into the hurricane season last year. So we were anticipating an active year. We're forecasting 70% 70, 70 chance of above normal, uh, number-wise calling four to eight. And that was based on expecting El weak El Nino conditions to continue. So here is a graph showing this is a this oceanic Nino index is an average of the ocean temperature near the equator. What's used for defining El Nino La Nina? Uh, and it's departure from normal. Uh, we take the ocean value, subtract what the average value is, and if it's a, if it's positive, it's warmer than normal. If it's negative, it's less than normal. So here we were. You can see the the little red spotlight. Here we were going into last hurricane season. Uh, we're above that red line. That red line, that half degree Celsius above normal, is the threshold we use for defining El Nino. Above that line, it's weak El Nino. We call this weak El Nino. It's just uh, within that. Uh, it's, it's limited warm water. This one here, you can see 2015. That was a very strong El Nino almost two and a half degrees above normal uh, com compared to some of the other big events. So, you know, like the 97, 98 um, wasn't quite that high. So, so this 2015 event was uh, pretty significant. The, the one that we had last year was much weaker. And going into hurricane season, we were expecting that to continue. Um, but what happened instead, well, we cooled off pretty quickly. We went back to, to neutral conditions, which for, for us, like we had mentioned before, El Nino, we tend to have busy years in the Pacific. La Nina, we tend to have very quiet years. And during average conditions, we have near normal values, which is what we ended up having for Kiko had been five, so, so four to five right near average. <laughs> so what does that mean heading into the new year or the, the new hurricane season? This is where we are. We warmed up again. We didn't quite hit El Nino conditions. We have to have a half degree Celsius above normal for uh, five months in a row. And we were right about here where we made the outlook. Since then, we've cooled off a bit. It's kind of hard to see in this graph because this is averaged over a three month period. But if I switch to the next one, uh, these maps show you uh, the weekly average temperatures. Image on the left is the actual ocean temperature in Celsius, and the image on the right is the departure from normal. Uh, again, the, the red colors are above normal and the blue colors are below normal. And it's the area right along the equator that defines El Nino. I guess that's tough loop. Let's go back. So it's the area right here along the equator that defines whether it's El Nino or La Nina. And the thing that stands out about this loop, especially over the last month or so, there's been some pretty significant cooling along the equator. So we were um, kind of on, on the warm side of normal to begin with through here, went to neutral, and now we have this big area of below normal temperatures right there along the equator. Kind of signs of potentially a, a, a developing La Nina as we head through the, through the year. So that'll might factor into what we see this year. Before I switch off the slide, the other thing I'll point out is El Nino is defined right along the equator, but there's also uh, warmer waters here near Hawaii. Uh, it's only a, a half degree to a degree above normal near us, but there is a uh, warmer than normal water near us. It's been like that um, for a while now. Uh, it's a little cooler than it was last year but would still contribute to warmer than normal temperatures, higher humidity. And if it stays like that and stays warmer, it could have an impact for any tropical cyclones approaching us from the east, being able to maintain their strength as they move towards us farther north. But as far as the cooling near the equator, uh, this is uh, one of the outlooks that we use uh, or to go into the season outlook. 
this is a, a conglomeration of different computer forecasts to come up with a probability of whether it will be ENSO neutral, El Nino warm phase, or La Nina cold phase. This is the one from early May that we used for doing the season outlook. The, the, the gray bars are what the probability forecast is. And uh, you can see the, the gray is neutral conditions, very high probabilities of that. Red, uh, but much lower here to begin with. And then blue is the La Nina, increasing chances later in the year, but not until uh, winter time does it get to very similar. So this points towards more neutral conditions continuing through the summer, but still with a, a, a notable red here for possible uh, lot, possible El Nino developing because we were right on that cusp. We were right near a half degree. And a lot of the long range climate models that we have have a hard time uh, going past the spring. For, for a reason, for whatever reason, there's a higher uncertainty in these models as you um, go through the spring and try to forecast out through the summer and into the fall. Um, but now we're getting past that point and between that and what we're seeing uh, with the cooling now, this is an updated graph uh, for this for the current month. Uh, still showing pretty high chances for into neutral conditions, but much higher probabilities for La Nina developing. Um, with uh, equal chances between the two by the time we get uh, towards the fall. So for us, this is good news. Step ahead to the outlook slide. This is the the, the, the main uh, hurricane season outlook uh, information that we gave. We we're calling for a 75% chance of near to below normal season. Number wise, it was two to six tropical cyclones. And it's a, a larger than normal range. Normally, uh, we use uh, we use four numbers, uh, three to six, uh, four to seven, five to eight. There's a little larger range here, thinking that we're going to be cooling off, going to neutral or La Nina, but still that potential of having up to six with a, a slightly above normal year, a 25% chance of an above normal season, gives you that larger range. But now, as we're seeing the cooling going on, it points more towards the near to below normal aspect of that, uh, which is good news for us in the Pacific, uh, the corollary is that that usually means the Atlantic has uh, a more active season, which I, I know they're not uh, very looking forward to. Probably whether we're a busy year or a quiet year, the, the most important thing I can stress about this outlook is that it, 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 doesn't, it shouldn't matter at all what your preparations are based on the outlook. The outlook itself is just for the Central Pacific Basin between 140 and the day line. It doesn't address any potential impacts to Hawaii. We could have one hurricane during the year, but if that hurricane hits us, if it makes landfall, uh, we could be devastated. Uh, 2015 was a, a record setting year for us and all the cyclones, they moved around us. We were left free in the middle. So even though we had an extremely busy year in 2015, we escaped without uh, significant uh, impacts or any landfalls. Whereas uh, last year we had six, uh, I'm sorry, in, in 2018, we had six tropical cyclones, slightly above normal, but still we had Olivia make landfall. We had Lane approach us, uh, bring some significant impacts, and widespread flooding from that. So we had a lot from that, even though it was a much quieter season than 2015. So the, the, the key about this, whether it's busy or whether it's quiet, uh, shouldn't impact how you prepare for hurricane season. And I also added this slide, it's a lot of details. This is meant to be a reference for the future. Um, we're recording this presentation, it will be available if you want to look at it again later. Uh, also, if you want these slides, if you want, want to reference them or refer to them, review them yourself, uh, I'm happy to share them with you as well. Uh, the, put together some of these uh, information, you know, information sources for where to uh, prepare. So weather.gov slash hurricanes gives you information from the National Weather Service about how to prepare. 
ready.gov is the consolidated FEMA website that has a ton of information. I've highlighted two of their subpages here since they have a, a lot of information. One, information about hurricanes, and one, ready.gov slash kit for details about um, a preparedness kit. Um, the other highlight I have here is uh, the ready.gov will say three to seven days. Here in Hawaii, we want to emphasize having 14 days of food, water, medicine uh, on hand because we're more isolated than they are on the mainland. It could be much longer to get supplies back in here. For more of a Hawaii focus, uh, we also want to recognize uh, the preparedness booklet that Hawaiian Electric puts out. Uh, you can get a, a download a copy of that here. Um, since normally we would be handing these out at preparedness fairs, but those have all been canceled because of the current situation that we're in, you can get an electronic copy here. Uh, we've also had lots of questions from people for information about hurricane evacuation shelters, where they're located, how to find information about them, and the best place to get that information is through the, the county emergency management websites. And uh, this uh, website here, uh, through the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, has links to all the county emergency management websites, their social media accounts, as well as their push notification systems. So if you want to get notifications from, from the county uh, about uh, impending hazards, about a variety of things, you can sign up for those there. Uh, National Flood Insurance Program is also pushing flood insurance this year, um, make, uh, wanting people to realize that uh, Flooding isn't covered by normal homeowners policies, so you have to buy separate uh, flood insurance policies, and, and you need to do that ahead of time uh, before there is a tropical threat. Um, the University of Hawaii Sea Grant publishes a book, Homeowner's Handbook to Prepare for Natural Hazards. Uh, this is a great resource for information about how to get ready ahead of time. It has information about what you want to have in a preparedness kit, uh, and also steps that you can take to help mitigate damage to, to your house or where you live, what you can do ahead of time uh, to strengthen your house, uh, maybe make it more, uh, more safe to stay in during uh, a, a hurricane event um, so you wouldn't have to uh, evacuate, go to an evacuation shelter. Uh, if, you do, if you do have to go to a shelter, uh, here's some information from the Red Cross that had to have about what to expect during those uh, from those evacuation shelters. Um, new policies for this year, uh, including uh, not just bringing food and water for yourself and your family, but also personal protective gear, masks, hand sanitizer, things like that that you would need for these environments. And because lots of us have kids, uh, if you want to, to engage your kids with this, uh, Ali Skywarn actually has a coloring book, uh, information for kids about how to prepare for a hurricane, what they are, that might be of interest. So hope, hopefully I didn't spend too much time on that. I just wanted to give all these resources out there. And with that, I'd like to uh, wrap up this portion, uh, turn it back to uh, Corbett so he can talk uh, a little more about parents and uh, answer any questions that you might have. Am I on now? My turn? Yeah, you're good. Okay. So, as John had mentioned earlier, you know, you may have to evacuate to a shelter. Uh, you'll get your direction from the county about that. And you're either going to have to bring one or two things. You're either going to have to bring your go kit, which is like a three day supply of necessary items. And that'll translate into a or turn into a 14 day supply if that shelter turns into a longer base shelter, uh, a congregate care shelter. So before you do that, you want to ask yourself two questions. The first is, what is it you need? And the second is, why? You know, why are you, why are you bringing these items to a shelter? You know, you don't want to bring any unnecessary things like uh, Xbox or a uh, PS4, Sony PS4 console system that's not something you would need there so some of the things that john had mentioned earlier is like medication uh now with covid19 that has changed the landscape a little bit where 
you're going to need to bring hand sanitizer. Uh, you might have to be rubbing alcohol. Uh, you might have to bring N95 masks. In fact, we would highly encourage you to bring those things because if you show up at a shelter, chances are you may not have those supplies available to you. So make sure that you have these items on hand and bring them with you to the shelter. Another thing you want to take into consideration is uh, some of the items that you're going to need, for example, like water. Uh, that may not be available because of all the COVID-19 things that are happening with us here in Hawaii and in the public where bottled water is not as available. You know, we have these shortages now. So what can you do about that? Well, the easiest solution for that is make your own water. You know, what you're buying from Costco or Walmart or Foodland, for example, is regular tap water. So instead of making a shortage, make your own. Buy some plastic containers like five gallon or three gallon empty bottles, get some bleach and use a ratio of one drop of bleach to a gallon of water and that'll disinfect your water. You can keep that supply on hand for 30 days and it'll be safe to drink. So again, you be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And make sure you have these things available. Uh, again, you want to have stuff like medication, uh, snacks, N95 masks, hand sanitizer, rubbing alcohol, antibacterial soap, change of clothes. Uh, if you have small children, have things to entertain them, like coloring books, uh, some games that they can do quietly. You know, all of these things are encouraged to bring, but again, ask yourself, what is it you need and why is it that you need them before you go out and you build your kits? So that's basically all I have to add to this subject that John went over just a few minutes ago, and I'm going to refer this back to John. Great. Thanks, Gavin. We've had a, a couple questions come in. Um, one of them is, is it better for our state if it tracks out for more? why that's a good one and um, of course i'm not going to give you a straight answer of course it depends um, a lot of times the approach from the south would be worse from us worse for us um, because normally there's warmer waters from the south uh, warm waters providing more energy more heat for the hurricane to maintain its strength uh, so approach coming up from the south comes from that warmer water, whereas a, a approach from the, the east or from the, the northeast coming down towards us is moving over cooler water. And actually, I suppose you can have a uh, approach from the west or the, the, the west-northwest as well. That's one thing that happened with Hurricane Hiki back in 1950, uh, past north of Kauai. That, the, the, re the reason why I know Hiki is from the a previous state rainfall record uh, was from that uh, uh, since, since beaten, but uh, it was one of those weird tracks passing north of us, uh, but it still maintains strength as a hurricane. So in general, an approach from the south is you know, would be likely stronger, but that's not always the case. If you have a near miss from the south versus a hurricane coming in from the east, can just be uh, still as damaging. Your placement in the hurricane, you know, where it is in the hurricane would also uh, impact what areas might see the most damage. Uh, um, might have heard of the, the right front quadrant. A, a hurricane is a low pressure system, so it's, it's rotating counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. So as it's moving forward, that forward quadrant on the right side is where you have strongest winds is also where the waves are going to be highest because they're building up by the winds and moving along with it. So you have a lot of uh, potential damage sources in that area. So uh, as it makes landfall, you know, to the right of the track will be most damaging. To the left of the track will still have damage, but not as much and not as much storm surge, for example. So there's a, a lot of things that come into play with that. Uh, there's another point I wanted to make. It's south. Oh yeah. Um, the other potential impact for everybody in the state, even if it's just uh, an Oahu impact, is uh, the other concern is that 
all the infrastructure on Oahu, uh, airport, the deep draft harbor, harbors are on the south shore within a short distance of each other. So a strike from the south could take all those out at the same time, which would severe, severely hamper our ability to bring in bring in food supplies, bring in uh, construction equipment to, to repair damage. And that's uh, what has led to the recommendation for having at least 14 days of supplies. If you can have more, that's even better uh, for a safety margin. But having a minimum of 14 days, uh, that's based on the time it was expected to be able to get equipment over here, clear the harbor and get in, uh, supplies flowing again. So I guess in that standpoint, uh, a, a, a pro approach from the south would probably be <laughs> Irwin. I guess is a long, long, long way to long-winded answer to your question. The short-winded answer is uh, it's worse for us if it comes from the south, I suppose. Uh, ah, Brad, yes, that's a, a good question or a good comment. Um, this is uh, we're we've done this webinar uh, a couple times on Monday evening. Uh, we also have a, a, another webinar. David Lopez from Hawaii Emergency Management, Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, uh, will be talking about critical infrastructure and uh, go into more detail what I just mentioned about uh, vulnerability of the ports and why we need to prepare for that uh, potential impact. And it's act actually from David that I, I've learned that information that I, I've given to you. So it's even better to hear that from him directly and in more detail. And that will be Wednesday evening. And if you give me a moment, I will share that registration link so you know and easily go ahead and register for that. In the meantime, let me know if you have any other questions. Okay, so the the link I, I, I just sent is for the registration for David's talk on Monday Monday evening. I have another question too. It's not necessarily regarding the Pacific, but a dust from uh, the Saharan Desert affecting Atlantic hurricanes. Not a big expert on the Atlantic Basin, but I, I, I know it's been in the news recently about uh, a, lot, a lot of dust impact from Africa spreading out across the Atlantic. One of the things, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the ingredients needed for a hurricane, you have warm water, low wind shear, thunderstorms, a little feature, is also an upper level disturbance. So these, what, are known as easterly waves tracking off of Africa. Uh, disturbances can help amplify organized thunderstorms, help them grow and develop. And that's one of the things that can contribute to, to more hurricanes. Um, actually, uh, Dennis, I see you on here. Let me unmute you. Um, Give you a chance to talk. Uh, Dennis, uh, you're unmuted. Would you like to say a few things, especially regarding the homeowner's handbook? Um, I was just typing a question for you, John. And, and I was um I was maybe ask two questions and then I'll talk about the handbook. Sure. Okay. Can you hear me first of all? Yep, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Um so I was gonna ask, like, are the warmer waters uh, in the Central Pacific, are they related to climate change? And um, also, uh, you know, in 26, 2015, when we had those 16 tropical cyclones, it was supposedly a super El Nino. So is that, if the waters continue to warm, are the El Ninos gonna get stronger and more frequent? Okay, so those are good questions. I'll and I'll preface this with uh, I'm not a climate scientist, so I don't have all the answers or all the details. But um, yes, the ocean water is getting warmer, and I, I, I mentioned earlier that we are seeing impacts from that warming um, in the tracks, uh, tracks shifting uh, poleward, shifting more towards the more northward in the northern hemisphere. Uh, that's something that has um, 
come out of the analysis of past hurricane tracks over the last several decades. So that's based on observations. Um, there's a lot of computer models that are looking at what happens in the future. There's a lot more uncertainty with that because, you know, from a weather forecasting standpoint, we, we have, uh, it's, it's interesting trying to forecast out the next few days, let alone decades or centuries. But uh, the, the science that we're seeing is increasing threat for us here in Hawaii, one from the warmer waters shifting the tracks northward, and also um, some of the simulations are showing a decrease in wind shear over the state, weakening wow. trade winds and uh, uh, decrease in shear. And it's been the shear that has been uh, had the, the negative influence that have caused a lot of cyclones to weaken, like with Lane in 2018. The, the question about the El Ninos and the, whether those are increasing or not, I don't know. Uh, if there's a cor expected correlation with that or not, because El Nino is based on an anomaly itself. It's based on above normal or below normal ocean temperatures. So if the whole average is going up, uh, the difference between the water along the equator and elsewhere, if everything's warming, that doesn't necessarily mean it uh, is gonna have a stronger influence. Um, it could, it might not. One of the impacts, we, we associate El Nino with warm water in the Pacific, but uh, that's not the only impact. Warm water in the Pacific wouldn't affect the Atlantic, but it does change the global wind pattern. So during El Nino years, we have uh, not just warmer water, but less wind shear over us in the Central Pacific. And the two of those uh, lead to more tropical cyclones in, in, in the Pacific. Uh, El Nino years also lead to higher than normal wind shear in the Atlantic, and that's what contributes to less tropical cyclone activity there. And the opposite is true. During La Nina years, we tend to have stronger trade winds, uh, uh, more, more wind shear over us, leading to less uh, tropical cyclone activity, and less shear in the Atlantic leading to more activity. Um, so I guess that's a... Uh, a long-winded way of saying, I don't really know how the El Nino, La Nina pattern would change or be affected by warming ocean temperatures, but it's a, it's a good question and, and one that I, I don't doubt climate scientists are studying now. Okay, thank you. And um, you also, I just wanted to, you wanted me to just mention the homeowner's handbook. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a free, book. Um, you could download it. Um, just Google University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program, and it'll get you to the uh, front page. And then you could um, navigate your way to download a free copy of the book as, as a free PDF file. We also have uh, printed copies, but um, it's been hard to distribute with social distancing. Normally, like John mentioned, a lot of the agencies do a lot of outreach every year. We go to emergency fairs, and um, but all of those have been canceled. So people got to do everything virtually, you know. And um, you're gonna have to get your information from from webinars or um, or the book itself. Or, or but you could also contact myself um, if you have questions. You know, we. In the book, we cover emergency supplies, evacuation planning, um, you know, considering the triple threat from a hurricane, the, the waves, the wind, and the flooding and water. And then we also cover a lot about strengthening homes. And um, the, the key thing we really want all homeowners to do is add their hurricane clips. That's the, the hurricane clip ties the roof to the wall. Um, and that's the weakest part of a house. You know, a lot of Jernaniki, a lot of roofs were flying off the house. Um, so it's not that hard to do. Um, if, you're, if you have initial guidance, say you contract a licensed structural engineer or architect, um, you could get started if you're handy. And it'll, it'll, cover, it'll be like um, $300 in material costs. It may take you 
two Saturdays to do it. It's a, it's, it's a very simple retrofit, actually. Um, pe people could do that. And then um, there are more advanced things we have in the book, like protecting windows and things like that. And um, if you have any questions, um, you know, download the book and then uh, my contact information. And if you go to the University of YC Grant College program, there's a directory. And I'm Dennis, and the last name is H W A N G. And you could just find me in the directory and phone me or email me, and we'll try and get you help or started. Great, thanks a lot, Dennis. Appreciate the appreciate the the help and the uh, access. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to type them in or. Uh, see, the, there's a green hand button with an arrow. If you click that, you'll raise your hand, and we'll, uh, it'll put your, um, bring you to our attention, and we can unmute you if you want to ask any questions that way instead. So, not seeing any more. Um, Hopefully uh, this is informational and uh, you got some something you took away something from it. As I mentioned, let me know if there's if you like a copy of the presentation. Happy to share that, and we'll also post this to our office YouTube page as well. And we'll once again remind or mention the uh, webinar that David Lopez will be doing, uh, talking about critical infrastructure vulnerabilities uh, Monday evening. That you can join us through the through the same venue. Gavin, do you have any closing words? I am good. <laughs> okay. Well, well, thank you much for helping uh, organize this, and everybody here, uh, thank you much for joining us. And we'll see you later and have a good afternoon. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for stopping by.